John Mack, as I said, is one of our British faculty, and he actually um, has a PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and that's sandwiched between his um, his bachelor's degree uh, from UC Irving, Irvine in chemistry, and uh, and then um, postdoctoral work he did at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, also in atmosphere chemistry. Um, so today he's going to be talking about chemistry processes and um, historically, or you know what what the atmosphere was like in the past, or what processes were going on and um, John. Okay, so when Josie asked me for a title, I hedged clearly. This is an extremely broad title, right? <laughs> and the reason is because I've, I've got two uh, projects, which are kind of main projects for my group, and they're a little different. And so my first thought is I want to talk about everything because I love everything, uh, which means you guys are going to be drinking from a fire hose for 45 minutes, and the only person happy with that result is going to be me. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to focus on one project and one experiment first, or one set of experiments first, and then if I've got time left over, we'll move on to the next one. Can you turn the volume down a little bit? Oh, I'm too loud? I get that. Volume down. Okay. Sorry, Mary. Wait, this is a new system, so tell me what's going on. Oh, so I'm like the guinea pig? What? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> Test A, B, C, D, E, F, G. How's that? I can move this. Sorry. The other thing is while we're adjusting the Hello, 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 hello. Students or faculty would like to continue discussions after the seminar with John, there will be lunch in the Kubo room today. How's that? We'll get you. Alright, whatever. So anyway, uh, in my group, there's basically <laughs> lights, 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 lights. They like the lights. That's good. <laughs> you, you, you be quiet. You be quiet over there. Can I go now? <laughs> Alright, so in my group, um, there are basically two overarching themes of research, and they're related, right? So the first one is, what does it say? To quantify the oxidation state of the atmosphere by determining a relationship among different trace gases on the hemispheric and global scale. And then the other one is kind of the same thing, but to look at the more local, more regional scale. And the difference here really is the scale, right? The spatial and temporal scale. In the first case, if you're looking at large scale, and when I say large, I mean global and hemispheric, uh, and if you're looking at long-term time scales, decadal, centennial, millennial, you can and you really need to use a proxy that kind of covers a broad swath throughout the chemistry region, right, the chemistry subject, and you lose the fine detail by necessity. However, if you look in the small spatial scale or in the short time scale, uh, then you can bring to bear many more instruments, many more observation types, and get a more detailed, more thorough explanation of the chemical processes that are going on. So in the first case, for example, here, you may be studying, like I said, long-term time scales, big spatial scales, global hemisphere. In the second case, to understand the role of local emissions of reactive trace gases, such as these hydrocarbons, um, during a summertime, for example, a summertime intensive, these things, uh, these types of campaigns are at one location, typically during one to two to three seasons, and you can measure as many species as you can to look at the very fine, the very detailed mechanisms that are going on controlling the regional chemistry. And then from that information, you can extrapolate to other locations, other regions, other times, but that's where the uncertainty uh, propagates. Okay, so anyway, um, these two are related. So when I say oxidation state of the atmosphere, what do I mean? I basically mean the reactivity, right? So in the atmosphere, you have um, a bunch of trace gases. Anything you release, anything whether it's coming from your tailpipe or whether you dump gasoline on the floor or ethanol or whatever outside, it evaporates. Where does it go? What happens to it? The vast majority of these reactive gases are actually... Um, oxidized within the atmosphere. And these processes 
are uh, controlled largely by hydroxyl radical OH. Hydroxyl radical is the atmosphere's most important oxygen. You know, Mary, this is probably a low battery. So that's why it's buzzing. That's, that's usually why. It's so that. I can actually hear the buzzing now. It's like bugging me. Okay, anyway, so from a chemistry perspective, hydroxyl radical is the atmosphere's most important oxidant. It's very reactive. Its average lifetime is fractions of a second, milliseconds. And therefore, its abundance is very low. Fractions of a part per trillion. What's a part per trillion? If you have an Olympic-sized swimming pool, you take your micro pipette, fill it up, go over to another Olympic-sized swimming pool, and put one tiny drop into that and mix it up, that's about 10 parts per trillion. So 10 to 100 times less than that is the amount of OH that you have, relatively speaking. Okay? Not very much material. OH radical oxidizes most car carbon-containing gases in the atmosphere, including methane, greenhouse gas, carbon monoxide, isoprene, etc. In fact, methane is oxidized to carbon monoxide first, and then further oxidized to CO2. All reduced carbon-containing gases in the atmosphere eventually end up as CO2 if they remain in the atmosphere long enough. OH distribution follows the sun. If you remember just a few things from today, remember this. OH concentration and the production of OH is dependent on sunlight. It's photochemical. So, you can see that during the day, you have a lot, and at night, you hardly have any. You have some because there are some nighttime processes that can occur over land that give you a little bit of OH, but really only usually between 1% and 10% of what you normally get during the day. Not very much. So, OH distribution follows the sun. Super reactive, not very much stuff. Therefore, you can see that there's a lot of spatial and temporal heterogeneity, right? The concentration of OH will go basically from zero to two times 10 to the six molecules per cubic centimeter. That's what we use to measure OH. Uh, between nighttime and daytime, or between northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, we fall, winter, etc. So, so far, we know OH is arguably the most important reactive gas in the atmosphere. That's probably true. Its reactivity determines the lifetimes of most reduced trace gases, including methane, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons. OH will also largely determine the formation rate of secondary organic aerosol. And so what, what is that? What do we care about? Um, why do we care about that? I'm not going to talk about this. But what that means is an aerosol, if it's light in color, it can change the radiative forcing of the atmosphere. This is probably a second order effect, but it can impact how uh, for example, the reflectivity in certain regions, right? So you can actually uh, change your radiative forcing in certain areas due to the formation of SOA. And the formation of SOA can be impacted by the chemistry, the gas phase chemistry that goes on prior to the formation of these aerosols. So what happens to OH radical? In today's atmosphere, between, one, between uh, two thirds and three quarters of all OH reacts with one of two gases either carbon monoxide, CO, or methane. The rest, the remaining OH, reacts with whatever else is there, whether it's isoprene or acid aldehyde or ethanol, etc. If that's the case, then the abundance of these two gases in the atmosphere is going to determine how much OH there is in the atmosphere, right? If you assume that the production rate of OH is relatively constant, and then if you change the abundance of these two gases, then you will impact the standing concentration of OH. And in turn, if you increase the amount of CO and methane in the atmosphere, for example, you'll have a net decrease in average OH concentration. When you do that, you impact the lifetimes of all the other reactive gases. So it's kind of like a, a chain reaction, right? So if you can understand what CO and methane are doing in the atmosphere, and if you can constrain that, uh, through observation, then you can say something about this system. You can say something about the oxidation state of the atmosphere. You can do this today, and by using the same proxies, you can do this from past atmospheres if you can make the observations. Why don't we measure OH directly to do this? Well, as I mentioned before, the reactivity is super, super high, milliseconds, right? Uh, the distribution, the spatial concentration variability is super high, two to three orders of magnitude. So yeah, we can measure OH directly. First of all, it's not an easy measurement to make. You use long path um, uh, 
laser fluorescence, you can maybe get it over one to two kilometers distance. Uh, but those measurements, one, are very challenging to make. And two, you can only do it in a few different locations because these systems cost half a million to a million bucks a piece. And you can only do it for short periods of time because your instrument breaks down all the time. So you can't really quantify OH directly. You have to use proxies if you're interested in determining the oxidation state of the atmosphere. Again, it's a scale thing, right? Okay. So then we're going to use as a proxy for OH this system, the CO methane OH system. So the first thing you want to do is you want to constrain the system today. Do we understand the CO chemistry, the CO cycling, and the methane cycling in today's atmosphere? To answer this question, we go all around the world, we measure CO concentration over time, and we measure the isotopic composition. The reason why we measure the, the isotopic composition is because the abundance of stable isotopes gives us information on relative source strength of varying sources of CO. We're going to focus on carbon monoxide today. A lot of studies have also been done on methane. We do some methane work, but primarily we're uh, more focused on CO. So let's just look at CO then. Carbon monoxide has four big sources. If you know these four big sources, you got about 85 to 95% of the budget. These four sources in no particular order are methane oxidation, non-methane hydrocarbon oxidation, so any hydrocarbon that's not methane, fossil fuel combustion straight out of your tailpipe, and biomass burning. Now, I've plotted this on an isotope plot where you have delta C13 and delta O18 on the y and x axis. So for each major source, you have a specific isotopic signature, stable isotopic signature. Don't worry about the deltas, don't worry about the per mil. What's, what's important to remember here is you have these distinctions in some cases. For example, uh, delta C13, or the car carbon-13 abundance in atmospheric methane, is low compared to other sources of CO. It has a delta C13 of about minus 52. Delta C13 in the atmosphere is around minus 47 and a half per mil. And then there's a kinetic isotope effect upon the methane OH reaction that further fractionates your methane derived CO. Bottom line is your methane, your, your methane derived CO is very depleted in the minor isotope carbon 13. At the same time, your oxygen 18 from methane oxidation is pretty light. It's around zero with respect to SMO, standard mean ocean water. Let's look at some of the other sources. Non-methane hydrocarbon oxidation has a similar and analogous pathway of oxidation as does methane. So the oxygen isotopic signature is similar, right around zero, but the carbon isotopic signature is a bit more enriched. If we look at oxygen 18, you can see that a combustion source, a burning source, whether it's fossil fuel, biomass, or whatever, is enriched in oxygen 18, between, between around plus 18 and plus 23 and a half per mil. And the reason for this is when you burn a tree or paper or whatever, you're incorporating atmospheric oxygen to the carbon dioxide that's, that's uh, produced, or carbon monoxide, right? CO is produced from incomplete combustion. So because you're incorporating atmospheric oxygen, which is enriched in oxygen 18, your product then becomes enriched in oxygen 18. This means that we can actually use some of these stable isotopes to help distinguish between different sources. For example, Carbon-13 is really useful in distinguishing your methane-derived CO from everything else. There's a big difference between this guy and everybody else up here. Oxygen-18 and the abundance of oxygen-18 is very useful in distinguishing combustion-derived CO, whether it's from biomass burning or fossil fuel combustion, compared to atmospheric processes, oxidation by OH. Oxidation is primarily driven by OH, right? So that's the take-home point, is that oxygen 18 is good for distinguishing combustion versus non-combustion sources of CO, and carbon 13 is good for distinguishing methane-derived CO from everything else. Oh, I don't have to go there. Okay, so, so what do we do now? So like I said, we go around the world, we measure the concentration and abundance of CO over time. We do this in, uh, you know, places like Mauna Loa, because I really like Hawaii, Barbados, 
because sometimes Barbados is nicer than Hawaii, uh, Iceland, I don't know why I went to Iceland, and uh, Bering Head, New Zealand. We're trying to get a latitude and distribution right. So we go high latitude, mid latitude, low latitude, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere. We make all these measurements, we take monthly means, et cetera, and then we use uh, computer models to simulate our observations. Now the computer models initially are completely independent of our observations. We use for these uh, uh, simulations Mozart, the Mozart model, which is a CCM, it's a 3D CCM using climatological winds out of NCAR uh, with my uh, colleagues at NCAR. And you can see here that the forward model simulation, so what they do is they, they have this very sophisticated computer model into which they put our best known guesses for spatial and temporal emissions for every source of carbon monoxide. So you just generate all the CO. You say, all right, we got fossil fuel coming from mid-latitude northern hemisphere from Europe. We got biomass burning from Brazil, particularly during the dry season, et cetera. And these emissions inventories, a lot of work has been put into these emissions inventories. And there are best guess in terms of what's going on in today's atmosphere. So you take all these different inventories, you stick them in the model, you run the model, and then you go to different places in the model and say, okay, what does CO look like here? What does it look like here? And you simulate your observations. But the initial model run is independent of our observations. So the initial model run is shown in the uh, blue line. And you can see, in some cases, initial model runs are really good. This is Mauna Loa. This is Barbados. Um, I'm talking just for concentration now. And this is Iceland and this is Bering Head. That looks really good. However, when we first started doing this work, we were the only ones measuring the isotopes of carbon monoxide. And you can use these models to simulate the isotopic composition of CO as well. That's something one of my grad students did. Uh, he graduated a couple of years ago at Keown Park. And uh, you can see that the model simulations aren't quite as good. Again, it's the blue line, right? And the reason for this is because nobody really looked at the constraints. But in some cases, particularly in the northern hemisphere, uh, mid-latitude, high-latitude, northern hemisphere, and southern hemisphere, the simulations aren't too bad for oxygen 18 either, but they could be improved. So that's where we perform inversion analyses. That's where we take our observations, we use them to be able to tweak the emissions inventories within the model. We recalculate, and then we come up with a new um, inversion result shown in the pink here. So you can see that uh, by doing this, by actually applying our observations to the model results, we can then improve the model performance by slightly modifying, using the Kalman filter technique, the uh, emissions inventories for the different sources of CO. And then you get the pink line here and here. Bottom line is the uh, inversion improves the oxygen 18 simulation and doesn't make worse the CO concentration uh, simulation. And you can think of oxygen 18 in CO and CO concentration as two separate tracers, right? You can treat them as two separate tracers. So it's an additional, it's truly an additional constraint. All right, so take home point. We pretty much know what we're doing. We pretty much have high confidence in that we understand the CO methane OH system of today. We can model it. We can use sophisticated models. We get to within 20% most of the time in most locations. That's pretty good. That's really good. So we understand, and, and of course, that's all dependent upon the OH that's generated in this computer model as well. And that's also pretty good. So we understand today's atmosphere pretty well. If you know today's state of the atmosphere, and if you know today's state of CO and methane, then you can extrapolate and go back in time, and if you can measure and reconstruct the CO and methane abundance and characterization in the past, you should be able to apply the same approach and then be able to reconstruct the oxidation state of the atmosphere back in time. So that's really the question we were asking um, for this project. How different, how different was the CO methane OH chemistry during pre-industrial times before all of us showed up when there were 100 million people on the planet versus 6 billion before we were digging fossil fuels out of the ground? So if we look then at the CO uh, carbon monoxide inventory during pre-industrial time, how would it differ? Well, you're not going to have any fossil fuel, right? You'll still have biomass burning, lightning strikes, etc. 
And when we say pre-industrial, we really mean pre-industrial. We don't mean we don't mean pre-human beings, right? It only takes a few human beings to light an entire continent on fire, actually. We still have plants, and we still have methane in the atmosphere, right? Nevertheless, the uh, carbon monoxide uh, inventory is simplified if we look if we go back in time. Okay, so how do we go back in time? Well, we have to find a place where we can go that stores ancient gas, stores the ancient atmosphere. Can't use sediment. Can't you know dig a box core. You got to use ice. You got to look at the bubbles trapped in ice cores. Where can you do this? Well, there's not too many places. There's Greenland. There's Antarctica. If you look at the map here, you know, yeah, you got a few glaciers here and there, but the problem with ice cores is that your bubbles are not completely sealed off until you get below the transition zone, because what seals off the bubbles is the weight of the ice or the weight of the snow above you, right? It's due to compaction. So the top 100 meters or so is diffusive. It's porous. You don't get the bubble sealed off in an ice core until you get down about 100 meters. So that limits you because many glaciers are not 100 meters deep or they're 120 meters deep, right? Also, if you have a fast moving glacier, that's another problem. So there aren't too many places where you can go. Antarctica is by far the cleanest. Greenland has a lot of uh, glaciers. You can see here, this is Greenland. Um, it's covered in ice and it's covered in a lot of ice. But, you know, this is like Europe right here. and. Europe, everything you do in Europe pretty much ends up in Greenland from an atmospheric perspective. It's not clean, right? You have a tremendous amount of organics being deposited that are um, originating from Europe, also from the United States and, and Canada, but much more so from Europe. So you have additional issues you got to deal with in the Northern Hemisphere. We chose the Southern Hemisphere. It's the simplest, it's the easiest, and it's the cleanest place to go for our initial studies. This is from the South Pole. This picture is a few years old. Um, I was there for some other reason. We were just unloading equipment. And normally you unload it from the back. Cause the C-130, the tail comes down. It's a ramp. You can drive vehicles and tanks and stuff. And so you normally unload it from the back, especially when these engines are running. But for some reason, we were unloading it from the front. And I can't remember why. They, just, they must have been doing something back there. But I remember this guy was helping me out. And he had wintered over at South Pole at the time. And you got to be a little uh, charismatic to winter over at the South Pole. This guy's like, oh, I love this work. The whirling blades of death meters away from your face. It's so awesome. And I'm like, okay, this is great. And then you're running between here and there. And your adrenaline's pumping. You've got like 50 pounds of equipment on your shoulder. And you're running back and forth trying to get it done as quick as you can because the pilots are yelling at you. you know, I want to take off. I want to get out of here. And this is a 12,000 feet elevation. And it's super dry, it's like minus 40 degrees that day. So you know, you're pumping, your adrenaline's running, you're going back and forth, and everything calms down, and the plane takes off, and suddenly you're completely dizzy and dehydrated, thinking, what just happened? The reason is because you're South Pole and running around like an idiot. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, here, this is where we got our first core. I didn't drill it. <coughs> so if you don't go drill your own core, how do you get it? Five easy steps. One, set up camp. This could take anywhere from one month if you're French or 10 years if you're American. <laughs> the process for uh, drilling an ice core is daunting. Um, it really, really does take at least five years to plan an ice core drill through the National Science Foundation. And I used to work at the National Science Foundation, so I can say that. After 10 years, you set up your camp, <clears throat> you take your drill down, and you drill a hole. Depending on how deep you go, you can do this in one season, or usually it takes multiple seasons, between two, three, and five seasons. Epica, the Epica core, <coughs> which the Europeans drilled, I believe, took five seasons. Bostock took at least five. Once you drill the core, and you drill the core in sections, right? Your drill bit is only about three to five meters in length. So you drill down, you take a chunk of core this big. You take your drill bit out. You take the core out of the drill bit. It's fractured, it's broken, all this stuff. You, you cut it up, you shave it, and you store it, and then you put the drill back down in the hole. It's a tedious, repetitive process. <clears throat> you only have three months to four months out of the year where you can do that. If you're at South Pole, you have two and a half months or so, two months. 
uh, because otherwise it's dark and nobody likes to work in the dark. So your drilling season is relatively short depending on where you are in Antarctica. Once you store the core, and you can store the core on the ice because it's always uh, the warmest it gets usually at these drill sites. This is Don Concordia actually, is around 30 below. So it's warm enough where your ice core won't melt or won't fracture. And don't forget, when you pull these ice cores out of the ground, they're used to being under pressure, right? And the pressure increases with depth. So it's like pulling, you know, for all you fish people, it's like pulling some benthic angler fish, right? From the bottom and ripping it up with a net and throwing it on the boat and see what happens to it. What happens to it? Blows up. So the same kind of thing can happen with the core. You pull it out of the core, and if it warms up slightly, the strength of your ice decreases and it'll start to fracture and stuff like that. So you don't want that to happen. Anyway, you store the core, hopefully for just one season, sometimes two or three, and then you get it off the ice. Typically, you use an aircraft, it's a deep field put in, you go to, the, uh, you go to McMurdo and they stick it on a boat. Then, you get your core back at your lab, and you got guys like me calling you up. Hey, how's it going? How did last drilling season go? You got any ice for me? And then they send you the ice. Now, uh, actually, it's not that bad. Nickel, the National Ice Core Laboratory in Denver, does have ice. They, there's an online website. You can see what ice they have if you want a chunk of ice. You write a little letter or proposal. There's a request form. You say why you want it. It's evaluated by a committee, and then they allocate ice to you. If nobody used the ice, people would not have an excuse to go back down to the ice to get more ice. And all these ice people love to go to Antarctica and drill, so they don't mind giving you ice. Nevertheless, most of our ice actually came from the French. Uh, we have a very strong collaboration with the uh, CNRS laboratory there. So once we get the ice here at Stony Brook, uh, we measure the ice, we extract the gases using our home-built equipment, we analyze those gases using isotope ratio mass spectrometry, uh, we got a spinning a 253 and a delta plus at, Stony, at Marine Sciences, they happen to be housed in my lab, but anybody can use them, just come talk to me. We also have a proton transfer time of flight mass spec. This thing is actually used for hydrocarbons and stuff, so if we wanted to look at organics in the same melt, melt water, uh, once we're done processing these other gases, we, we can. This is a pretty much of a state-of-the-art instrument here. Okay, so once we do that, we actually get some data, and these, with the, these are what the data look like. Um, this was the first data set that we published. They were the first measurements of the isotopes of carbon monoxide made from ice, and the second measurements of the concentration. So it was the first combined data set here that we published. and. I had no idea what to expect. Uh, Zhui Wang, this, this was part of his PhD thesis, he also, of course, had no idea what to expect. And I didn't have the heart to tell him when I was thinking about this project, I'm like, man, there's probably around a 60% chance that this is either not going to work or the results are not going to be interesting. So uh, turns out, turns out it worked, amazing. And it turns out that the results were really striking. This sort of trend, uh, this data set is probably the most interesting data set that's come out of my lab. Uh, this, this sort of trend over the last 650 years is something that we, we didn't envision, we didn't predict, or anything like that. These are the concentrations today. These uh, yellow symbols are from fern air studies. So take this with a grain of salt because these uh, samples were actually stored in um, silco steel cans. And I've worked with these silco steel cans. They're problematic. Uh, the X here is what you get if you go down to South Pole or Arrival Heights in Antarctica today and measure the concentration. Uh, this is an annual average. So you can use this as a comparison. We measured uh, concentrations in the isotopes of CO from uh, two different cores. This is from the South Pole ice core, an old South Pole ice core, and the uh, clear diamonds are from D47, which is from Dome C, Dome Concordia. CO concentration, you see this saddle type uh, uh, trend here. So working back 650 years, it seems like the concentrations around 650 years ago were similar to what we have today. And pre-industrial, they're similar to what we have today. But in the middle, we saw this significant decrease, almost a factor of two in CO concentration. This is accompanied by um, a fairly strong correlation with carbon-13 and it was accompanied by a fairly strong correlation with oxygen-18. So there's a story here. We just have to tease out what it is. 
So how do we do that? Well, like I said, we don't have to worry about fossil fuel combustion, so now you only have three major sources. And you have a couple minor sources. Oceans, for example, which are pretty small, most likely, and direct biogenic emissions of CO, which are also pretty small. Nevertheless, we can kind of constrain those using uh, chemistry models of today based on our best guesses, but the contribution is a few percent. The other, uh, the other source that we can constrain is methane oxidation, because methane oxidation is derived, of course, from methane. We've measured methane. We know what the history is, the paleo history is, of methane. We know this very well. This particular record is from Don Ferretti. He published this in 05. Um, uh, he was in New Zealand, then he went to Australia, and now I think, actually, Dom married a very wealthy woman, so he's retired now at <laughs> 38. Um, but he reconstructed this methane uh, concentration and the uh, isotopic composition of methane from a different core. And so you can see here, this is methane concentration, x-axis is time, second y-axis is concentration. You can see that we know this pretty well, right? And we're really operating during pre-industrial times in this region, from like the blue-red transition on back. So we're at about maybe 700 parts per billion methane, you know, to 600 parts per billion methane. The take-home point is there's not much variation in methane over the period of time we're interested in. We also know carbon-13 of methane here. He measured that as well. And even though this looks like a really big change in carbon-13, it's only about one and a half per mil, which is not very big. The take-home point is since you know what the methane concentration is and since you know what the isotopic composition is, you can easily calculate what the contribution is from methane-derived CO because it's just a ratio of the rate constants of methane OH, CO OH times concentration of methane. I said that just to impress you guys. So now you know this is zero and you can calculate this discreetly based on observation. No models are involved here. And what does that leave you with? That leaves you with two sources, two major sources, right? And we got two isotopes. So let's remember, can we distinguish these two sources using the stable isotopes? Yeah, because this is from atmospheric oxidation with a delta O18 near zero, and this is a combustion-derived process, which has a delta O18 closer to about 20 to 20, uh, 20 per mil, right? And also there is, I didn't mention this before, but there is a significant uh, difference in carbon-13. It's not as distinct as it is for oxygen, but it is there. All right, so it's pretty basic, man. You just use uh, an isotope mass balance model, very straightforward. And what you can do is you can calculate the relative contribution from each of these sources based on your observed isotopic composition variation with time. When you do that, you get something like this. So what, what are we showing here? We're showing uh, methane-derived CO. So this is methane concentration as observed. This is from, uh, well, McFarlinger's work is the same as Don Ferretti's work, same core. So the second y-axis, and then this is CO from methane oxidation. So this is methane-derived CO deduced from this curve. It's a straightforward calculation. So based on this curve, we get this curve, right? And then we can assign an isotopic composition to that curve because we know the isotopic composition of this curve. It's about a four per mil shift. When we do this and subtract out the methane-derived CO, the two sources that are remaining is non-methane hydrocarbon oxidation and biomass burning. And these are the results we get from the calculation. Not super exciting for non-methane hydrocarbon oxidation, right? We see that there's a relatively small, certainly within um, our error, within our precision, there seems to be no significant trend in the change in non-methane hydrocarbon um, oxidation. Now this is in parts per billion, so what this means is we're seeing on the order of 10 ppb of NMHC derived CO throughout time. Now, of course, this does change the relative contribution because the concentration is, is going from about 55 ppb to about 35 ppb, right? So you have 10 and 55 ppb, or about whatever that is, 17%, 16% contribution. And here you have 10 and 35, which is close to about 30% contribution, right? 35% contribution. So there is a change in the relative strength of non-methane hydrocarbon oxidation, but not in the absolute flux over time. 
biomass brain derived CO is a different story, however. Because of this, this guy here, it really ties your hands in terms of how you can fit these observations. And you get this trend here with uh, biomass burning, right? And so you can see that there, according to this uh, isotope mass balance approach, there's been a significant variation in biomass burning over the past 650 years based on our observations. Now, if we compare this with other work that's been done, not much work has been done. People have tried to use the charcoal index to reconstruct paleo biomass burning. The charcoal index is great. Uh, what they do basically is they go into lakes and stuff and they take cores and they measure layers of soot, right? Um, and, and they can do this in a lot of different places. They can do this in different latitudes, uh, different regions. The problem, of course, with, with soot compared to, compared to a gas, and I didn't mention this before, but the, um, the lifetime of CO in the atmosphere is on the order of one to three months. So it's pretty well mixed within the hemisphere, right? The lifetime of a charcoal particle is dependent upon the size of that particle. It could be hours, right? It could be days, it's not weeks. So you're talking about a very different tracer. One is a particle that's going to um, deposit, usually dry deposition because soot is not very uh, water soluble, and it's going to deposit fairly quickly. So that's a very limited, spatially limited uh, tracer and you're going to get high variability. Whereas carbon monoxide is a gas. It's fairly well mixed. If you're away from any point sources, as you are in Antarctica, then it's very well mixed, right? And it's representative of a larger spatial and temporal scale. Nevertheless, the charcoal index is certainly useful. So Jennifer Marlin has done a lot of work on this. Um, she's actually up at Yale part of the time. We should get her down here, actually. Um, and so she published this charcoal index record, and I believe this is from I think this is all, either all Southern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere tropics results. Um, the charcoal index is related to uh, charcoal uh, or soot abundance, right, over time. And her results are the red line and the shaded pink area. That's her area of, a, of precision or uncertainty. And you can see that, that she generally has, you know, all right, she has this trend, but the, you know, you could draw a straight line through this and be just as accurate. So she doesn't see a lot of change relative to her precision in the charcoal index before, say, 1700 or 1800. But she does see this decrease between 1900 uh, and present day. We don't have any data between here and here. I'll get into that in a second. So let's compare our observation or our, our calculation based on our observations. Ours is the green line and then the blue swath is our precision or uncertainty. So we provide a little bit more structure here that she doesn't get, but this sort of thing, the difference between here and here is confirmed. And this really was one of the big questions about this data set is like, well, geez, how do you get, how do you go from here to here? That's easy for concentration, but look where I am here. Ignore these data points, I'm not so sure about those. But how do I go from here to here? How do I go from here to here? That's a lot harder. So when we saw this, we were like, all right, well, at least Jennifer sees a similar trend, particularly over the last couple hundred years. And this sort of trend that we see, of course, is much more well-defined, but at least it's not in contrast, or it, it, you know, it doesn't disagree with, with what um, other people have done. And of course, our precision, our swath is a lot tighter, so our precision is a lot better, just because it's a better tracer of this uh, uh, mechanism. All right, so, so to sum it up, biomass burning is estimated to be more prevalent in the 14th century and the 19th century than in between those times. Observations also indicate biomass burning of some sort was a larger source in pre-industrial times, immediate pre-industrial times, compared to the last several decades. This counterintuitive hypothesis is consistent with Marlon et al. So that 20 years ago, if you asked any paleo modeler you know, how does biomass burning of today compare with biomass burning with, you know, in the 18th century, 19th century? They all would have said, what, are you kidding me? I mean, it's like, you know, 10 times higher, 15 times higher. We know this. Okay. So now if you ask that same question to the same people, about 70% of them would answer the same way, right? And then 30% of them would be like, well, actually, based on observations, it does seem like we don't know, right? So it's slowly starting to get out, and it's not that slow actually, but people are starting to have to, you know, 
explain these observations because before it was just an assumption that people made. Oh, there's more people, there's more clearing, there's more biomass burning now than there was 150 years ago. That sounds logical and that makes sense. That's not what the observations tell you. All right, so, and I'll get into maybe why that was in a second. Um, this gap here, what's going on? I don't know. It's going to be tough to explain. Uh, we can't be more recent than these data points within ice, right? Because what you need is you need the snow to fall very quickly for you to compact 100 meters. So you can imagine then that um, when you get below the transition zone, so you got your fern air and then you have your ice, the ice starts forming at 100 meters. Well, it takes time to get that 100 meters, right? So the greater deposition rate you have, the younger the air is trapped at the top of the ice core, but even where you have high deposition rates, you're still talking about like 50 to 80 years of age right there. And then you're integrating too because it's, it gets complicated, but the point is you can't really reconstruct this area using bubbles and ice. You gotta use fern air. Fern air, as I mentioned, that's the area above your ice. That's porous, it's not closed off yet. So as it compacts, you can see that the porosity is going to change. Well now, I can, I can dig down 80 meters and I can stick a bladder there and I can suck out as much air as I want, but where is that air from? How old is that air? It's integrated between today and maybe 50 years ago. So then you have to model it. You have to model the porosity and the rate of diffusion of air into and out of the fern. So now you're model dependent. You're slightly model dependent with the bubbles, but since they're closed off, they're closed off, they're done. So what happens is with fern air, when you get really close to the transition, you go down in time, it's like present day, present day, present day, present day, present day, 50 years old. And so like with this much fern air, you're going back about 40 years in time, just as the close off starts to occur. Take home point, getting data from fern air is not straightforward which means I'm not super optimistic in answering this question using fern air. We'll have to try something else. Okay, why would there be more biomass burning in the southern hemisphere during pre-industrial times compared to today? And or why would there be less biomass burning during the Little Ice Age, which is really more of a northern hemisphere phenomenon um, than before the Little Ice Age? Clearly that's a typo. Okay, let's look then and see what we can explain in terms of other climate-driven observations. We can look at rainfall. Oops. We can look at rainfall. Uh, we can look at lake levels, historic lake levels. We can even look at deposition rates based on delta O18 and other ice caps, like the Kelkaya ice cap in Peru. So we do that, and we get records like this, right? You can see we have lake depth here as a function of time. This is from East Africa. And you can see around the 18th century and what is that, the 16th century, the middle 16th, 15th century here, we have two ages of prosperity. This is when your lake levels were high and the ages of prosperity led to a blossoming of humankind. You can look at other records like this. This is the Kelkaya ice cap core from Lonnie Thompson. Lonnie Thompson is basically, you know, if you ever think about doing anything with regards to ice or drilling, you're probably going to say, yeah, well, Lonnie Thompson already did that. He, he's been everywhere. He's drilled everywhere. He's one of two guys who've ever drilled the Kokaya ice cap in Peru. Uh, it's a 20,000 feet. It's in the tropics. Super windy, super cold, uh, very, very difficult. But anyway, he, he um, did this a little while ago. This, this is actually old data. It's not from 2003. It's from older than that. But you can see that your accumulation rate back in the 17th century was very high. This correlates to the Little Ice Age timing. Now this is in the Southern Hemisphere tropics, so it's not the exact same timing as the Northern Hemisphere Little Ice Age, but it's approximately the same. So you can see based on this rate of accumulation that that kind of identifies the tropical Little Ice Age time. So when you go back and then you look at the results of this, you know, of, of um, records such as this lake depth and ice accumulation records such as this, these are time periods that those two cover. So in this weird reddish pinkish color here, I've got the first age of prosperity and the second age of prosperity. So that might be where you had, for example, greater human perturbation. It might be where there were more fires during that time, agricultural clearing. And in the dark blue or the medium blue, the royal blue area in the middle, that's where the little ice age 
uh, occurred based on the Kelkaya ice cap observations. So during an ice age, you've got perhaps depressed temperature, uh, for example, and you would have increased precipitation in certain regions. Now, it doesn't have to be a global phenomenon. Maybe it's a tropical phenomenon. Maybe it's a subtropical phenomenon. Maybe the high pressure, low pressure region shifted a little bit and your fronts changed. Whatever. The point is, is that you could just wave your hands like a lot of paleo <laughs> and because we don't have the data. And you could say, well, you know, here and here you got, you got higher concentrations, greater emissions of CO. It could be anthropogenic, right? Or it could be driven by productivity, human productivity clearing. And then you have this region of long-term depressed uh, concentrations of CO reflecting a lower rate of biomass burning, which is concurrent with the Little Ice Age uh, and increased precipitation. What else? Um, this is where the hand waving comes in. I mean, there's a lot of phenomena that we assumed were constant relative to today, and that's, that may not be the case. Uh, what about dynamics? So if you look at Antarctica, uh, particularly during the winter time, there's a big temperature gradient as you go south, right? Antarctica is the coldest continent on the planet, particularly during January or uh, uh, what, June, July, May, June, July. So the Antarctic continent being a continent, you've got this radiative cooling, it's in the dark, and so it just gets colder and colder and colder. And so the air sitting on top of Antarctica becomes isolated, right? So you have this vortex, you have this polar vortex, which really isolates the air above Antarctica with the subtropical, the mid-latitude air, and the uh, tropical air. Did the strength of this vortex change? And if it did, would this impact your transport time between middle or low latitudes and high latitudes? And the answer is, yeah, I would. Um, how significant is that? That's more of a seasonal thing, right? During the summertime, the vortex does break up. So, you know, what are you arguing? That maybe the vortex didn't break up quite as much? Ah, it's possible. Uh, is there any evidence for this? Paul Majewski uh, published this in 2009. Uh, his record indicates that the last period of intensification of your westerlies uh, over East Antarctica and West Antarctica likely didn't occur prior to a thousand years ago. Our study was up to about 650 years ago. So there seems to be no observation that indicates that that's the case. Nevertheless, it could be, you know, but even if it were, basically what you're doing is you're saying, okay, it's going to take longer to get my gas over Antarctica. It's going to take me longer. So you can think of it as a two box model. Then I got my vortex air and then I got my subtropical air or whatever. And now I'm going to say, all right, my transport time from here to here is longer. So what does that mean for this gas? Well, maybe it'll get chewed up more by OH because it's hanging out before it gets here. So what does that do to the concentration? It'll decrease it. But how does it impact the isotopic composition? It actually impacts the isotopic composition in a very predictable manner. And that predictable manner is not reflected in our observation. And that's all I'll say about that. So it doesn't seem like that's really a reasonable thing, um, a reasonable explanation. Plus, if you look at the data one last time, you can see that it's a fairly consistent pattern over hundreds of years. Okay, what else? Oh, that's about it. So then, uh, what are we doing now? We've got a new ice core in our lab. This is from my colleagues in France. It's a brand new core, which dates back to about 5,000 years. So we're going to continue this work, but extend the record further back. Um, initial results are terrible, but um, I think we've got a handle on it now. So hopefully in the next few months, we'll be able to make some headway on that. We also have a proposal for the South Pole ice core drilling that's occurring this season. This is a two-year project. It's been about six years in the making. Eric Saltzman at Irvine is the PI. He's going to head down there next month, I think, or uh, no, October, and they'll start drilling. So if we're successful with this proposal, which we should hear about next month, we will re start receiving ice in the spring. We are asking for about 30% of this core. There are about 20 investigators who want ice from this core. So, you know, we're definitely drinking heavy from the trough. But we need that much ice for these kinds of measurements. And since we're the only ones who can make them, and since it's kind of interesting to everybody, uh, we're optimistic that we'll get it. Okay. Don't go anywhere, because really this is kind of what I wanted to talk about as well. So when we talk about oxidation state of the atmosphere, this is one of the applications. But another application, as I explained, is looking at those 
specific points in space or time. Forest emissions, biogenic emissions, is of real interest to the atmospheric chemistry community because what, what is emitted from these trees, in particular isoprene, the monoterpenes, and other hydrocarbons, dominates the chemistry that occurs within this area, which means it dominates the chemistry that occurs in the southeastern United States. Now, there have been a number of reports recently showing that the temperature trend in the southeastern United States has been either negative or a lot smaller than other parts of the United States. So the question is, is why? What's going on with the radiative forcing occurring in this region of the country? And one hypothesis is you've got isoprene, and this is the hotbed for isoprene. You have a tremendous amount of isoprene being produced. That isoprene is being oxidized, and then um, some of it is forming aerosol, and that's increasing your forcing, thereby leading to a feedback for temperature. It's probably wrong, but it was a great hypothesis and that went for it. And so they supported this huge, huge project. There were like maybe 30 universities, half a dozen trailers filled with $30 million worth of equipment, including ours. Um, and, and of course, the scientific uh, focus was, uh, there were a dozen big foci for this project. Our focus was on looking at the biogenic emissions from the forest, right? And so what we did is we developed new instrumentation, uh, it was aircraft instrumentation. We asked the question, what, are the, what is the vertical profile of these trace gases above the forest? You can stick a tower in this forest, and we do that, right up to about canopy height. So we know very well the mixing and the production of gases within the canopy. But what happens above the canopy as this stuff mixes out of the, of the forest, out of the trees, it's going to react. But how? How much? What does it look like? What do the concentrations look like? What do the vertical profiles look like above the canopy? We have no idea. This is state of the art before we started doing our work. And you can see that the observations are all over the place. It's basically a shotgun scatter plot. We can't really constrain what's going on just above our towers. So we decided to design a system for this airplane that I like to fly. And this system grabs basically a core of air from wherever I start, which is maybe like 50 feet or 100 feet above the trees, to about 2,000 feet up, or as close to the top of the mixed boundary layers I can get. So we designed, built this system, stick it on a plane. This is what the plane looks like. This is the plane that we used down there last year for uh, this particular intensive. This is the new aircraft that we got. It's about twice as big, so we can put more stuff in it. We go down there, we fly this plane, we do vertical profiles. We got this tower, so we're measuring concentrations of the reactive gas is there. We got this trailer. My senior graduate student, Lu Ping, is stuck in this trailer. I'm stuck in the plane. We got Kim, who drives the sample back from the airport to the trailer. It's all a big production. This is what it looks like in the plane. It's very vibrating. Uh, taking off. This is Bates Field in Alabama. Climb, 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 turn left, and then get the hyperspace transport button, and miraculously, boom, I'm on site. One, two, three, there I am. And then I start collecting my sample. I punch a button. Punch a button, John. Punch a button, and I start. And then you start to climb. You grab the sample. You bring it back down in the lab. You ask your graduate students to interpret it for you and make these really cool plots on Google Earth that I have no idea how to do. And you get something like this. So this is the flight path. This is over the site. This is the concentration of isoprene. And this is my wind vector. We also have a wind instrument that measures winds in three dimensions at 20 hertz on the aircraft. And we can reconstruct the vertical profiles of various trace gases over the site for the first time. So we get vertical pro profiles that look like this. Each line is binned with a number of different vertical profiles between two and six. Right? And what was remarkable to us over about 10 days of flying that the reproducibility and the representativeness of each of these profiles for each time bin was fairly tight. Right? So we start early in the morning at 10 a.m. and then we go to noon. So it's blue to green to red to black. You can see in the morning the concentration of ice cream is lower and then the afternoon is higher. But the structure is remarkably consistent. Right? And these are two-minute profiles. These are snapshot profiles. So we did a bunch of these, and now what we're doing is we're interpreting these results. 
uh, using special models and stuff like that. So the take-home point is this is better than this. And we're going to continue to do these kinds of studies in the future using um, these aircraft. And this was the team down there last year. Liu Peng, Licia, Lonnie, and Kim. These were, this was a research aircraft, and that was my buddy's plane. He was my release pilot, Fred Wimberly. And so thank you to everybody for all of your help, in particular my group here, uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We have, we're heavy collaborators, um, et cetera. I'll stop there. So your air bubbles are integrated over time, right? <clears throat> I didn't point that out. It's a good thing you, you brought it up. But the integration time is on the order of 30 or 40 years, depending on the deposition rate uh, of each bubble, right? So each sample, and uh, not each bubble, but of each sample. So our, our samples are about uh, six inches long. So depending on the deposition rate, that's about 80 years itself, well, 60 years. So each sample is an integration of those 80 years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wonder, do you have an idea about this spatial uh, variation? Because uh, there's such a huge change in bound that's not burning. Yeah, yeah. And, but again, yeah, I'm curious about this, what you call the charcoal index? Yeah, because they yeah, right. Right, so, so there's two things I would say. The charcoal index, you know, you take a bunch of lakes, right, and then you measure right around those lakes. That's actually a very um, spatially limited uh, tracer, and it's heterogeneous. CO, once you get to the mid-latitude, southern hemisphere in particular, free troposphere, it's well mixed because you're away from any point sources like in the tropics, et cetera. So by the time you get to Antarctica, I mean, we've been measuring, me and my colleagues have been measuring CO concentrations at arrival heights, which is like right around here for like 20 years, and we never see, the only time we see enhanced CO is when the winds are coming from McMurdo. So it's well mixed. Actually, I'm asking the opposite. I'm oh. curious where, where that might be a major spatial variation of style. Ah, okay. Uh, well, in the tropics. The relation must know that. Yeah. If you know, say, it's in Africa or somewhere, it's such a huge change. Um, yes, uh, yes. It's seasonal and it's spatial, for sure. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, Brazil, uh, you can do fire counts now with satellites. Right. In the past, in the past, uh, in the past actually, there's there's a, a couple of really good books I can show you later. But uh, in the past, people reconstruct um, biomass burning based on civilizations. Right. So if you if you talk to anthropologists and stuff like that, they're quick to point out that this region here actually was was um, there were a lot of people in this region in the 16th century, even in the 13th century. And so you can't quantify it, right? But you can find evidence of agricultural activities, etc. That's a little more hand waving because it's really hard to get a number, but other than that, you're kind of limited. The charcoal index does help if you got a lake around. Okay, so those who want to continue the discussion, you can.